So far, we've discussed a number of treatment effect estimators, and this leads to a natural question. If you have access to many different uh, treatment estimates, which one should you prefer? And that's what I want to talk about now. So far, we have mostly focused on simulations where we knew the right answer a priori. So comparing methods was easy, uh, but in real world data, we don't know what tau fix is a priori. Uh, so we're gonna uh, need to come up with uh, some new ideas uh, for evaluating uh, estimators for Kate. So some questions I want to focus on here include given two different estimates for Kate, which one is better? Or even more simply, given one estimate for Kate, is it providing any value or is it uh, worse than just predicting uh, zero everywhere? So for this purpose, uh, we need access to a data set, uh, and hopefully a data set um, that mirrors uh, something you might encounter where realistically you might believe um, unconfoundedness would hold. That is not a randomized trial, but where you have access to covariance X and it's at least somewhat plausible that treatment would be as good as random. Um, once you condition on X. And for this purpose, I'm going to work um, based on um, the California GAIN study. Um, so GAIN, or Greater Avenues for Independence, is a welfare to work program uh, that is a jobs training program uh, that sought to help people um, get uh, off welfare and rejoin the workforce. And here we're going to work with data from a randomized evaluation of GAIN that was conducted in the early 90s. Um, incidentally, this evaluation was uh, considered a success. Um, and uh, now GAIN is deployed um, in California. So anyways, um, and also first thing to note is that as part of this study, well, we have access to 54 covariates, uh, including uh, past income, uh, demographics, and so forth. Uh, so we have plenty to work with uh, here uh, for Kate estimation. But anyways, what makes this data set particularly interesting um, for this purpose is that they didn't actually uh, run one big randomized trial uh, to evaluate gain. Uh, they ran a number of small different randomized uh, trials in different counties. Here we have data from Alameda, Los Angeles, Riverside, and San Diego. And the counties were given quite a bit of freedom in how they ran their experiments. In particular, they were given freedom about who to enroll um, in the program. And they were also given freedom about um, what fraction uh, of kind of uh, people in the experiment to enroll into the treatment versus the control arm. And so then what ended up happening is that some counties um, focused on enrolling recent uh, welfare enrollees um, in the program, uh, whereas um, other counties focused on more difficult uh, cases, people who had been on welfare for a long time. Um, on the other hand, some counties randomized people to treatment and control 50-50, uh, whereas others went, I think, as far as 90% uh, of people into treatment and only 10% of people into control. So, okay. Uh, we have data from four counties. Um, each county ran a randomized trial, a different type of randomized trial. Um, how does this relate to what we want? Well, if you take all these four proper randomized trials and you glob them uh, into a single uh, batch, and then you forget which county each unit was from, now you have an observational study. Um, there are a lot of people in the data set. Uh, everyone in the data set was randomized to either treatment or control. Um, everyone in the data set was randomized to either treatment or control with a reasonable probability, overlap holds. But the probability with which any given unit was randomized to treatment or control varies uh, essentially uh, based on which county uh, they were from. Now we don't observe the county, but what we need to hope uh, is that uh, these 54 covariates uh, we got access to um, is enough to disentangle uh, any confounding bias introduced by kind of uh, smushing these four uh, different randomized trials um, together. Um, essentially, that unconfoundedness holds uh, given these 54 covariates. 
Uh, so that's the data set um, we're going to work with. Um, so just why do I like working with this data set? Uh, well, first, I think this is actually somewhat representative of a setting where you might want to use unconfoundedness-based methods in practice. Uh, and someone might also believe um, the output of the analysis. Um, if we had been in a situation where there was extreme selection into treatment, like there was an, someone tried to evaluate gain, but there had actually been no randomization. You just had two groups of people, one group of people who wanted to enroll in gain and they enrolled and then you see how it comes for them. And then another group of people who did not want to enroll in gain did not, and then you see outcomes for them. It's kind of essentially impossible to believe that an unconfoundedness type analysis could fix this, um, could um, give you an estimate of the effect of gain, because there's just a, such a fundamental uh, kind of selection effect. Um, people who wanted to enroll in gain were probably um, kind of it, both different um, in a way that you can't measure, but that's very important uh, than people who uh, didn't want to enroll in GAIN and not accounting for the, these unobservables would just be a huge problem. On the other hand here, there's no aggressive selection of this type. Um, the reason you have different uh, treatment probabilities for different people essentially depends more on where they happen to live uh, than on kind of some deep uh, unobservable uh, features. So it's plausible that kind of by adjusting for covariates, you could kind of account for this where you live effect um, and be okay. Um, I'm not saying that this is kind of with a data set of this type, everyone would automatically believe uh, an unconfounded type analysis, but maybe they'd at least humor it. Um, and another thing is I think this kind of data set, it's quite easy to end up uh, in. You try to run a randomized trial, but then something goes wrong. Maybe you, maybe you had, uh, in, under the hood, you had four different studies in your data set, but you just don't know that your data was collected in this kind of way. Uh, and then running unconfoundedness type analyses can also protect you against that. So anyways, that's one thing I like about this data set. The other is that once you've run your kind of observational study analysis on this, and you have some claims about how people uh, may or may not uh, respond to treatment, then if you want to check if you got the right answer, you can kind of re-stratify the data set into the four separate counties. In each of these four counties, you know the true randomization probabilities. So you can give a very kind of transparent objective RCT type assessment um, uh, of the uh, claims uh, you came up with uh, by working with the observational data. So I'm not going to do this now uh, when evaluating methods for Kate, but in the last segment of this lecture, uh, we're going to talk about uh, learning uh, treatment assignment policies. And then I am going to do that uh, to check that the policy we learned um, actually are better than just randomly assigning treatment. Okay, here's the data set. Uh, we wanted to do a measure the effect of gain uh, on uh, future labor market outcomes. So let's do it. Uh, I train a T forest, S forest, X forest, and causal forest here. Uh, these histograms show out of bag estimates of tau hat. And the question is which ones of these are good, which ones are not. Uh, so here you probably can't see the X and Y axes here. Um, but this is, here you can uh, zoom in. Um, the, the, the units here um, are essentially, they, they measure uh, earnings uh, post, um, in the average over the nine years post intervention. Um, I don't remember what the scaling is exactly, but this corresponds to kind of hundreds of dollars of extra earnings um, average, on average per quarter uh, over the nine years uh, post intervention. So these are large uh, treatment effects. And so what these plots show are histograms of the out of bag treatment effects you get from different forest-based methods. So how are we gonna compare these? Uh, I guess at this point, it's not a huge surprise that I'd want to uh, use the R loss for this purpose. 
Uh, so, so far we've talked about the R loss as a tool for learning case estimates, but nothing stops you from training a causal forest, uh, which is essentially a random forest version of an R learner. Training an X forest, these are two separate algorithms that may fail or succeed for kind of a number of reasons. And then using the R loss as a tool to assess both of them. So it seems reasonable. I did that here. And here's the answer. Uh, if you fit a causal forest, your R loss is 2.39. If you fit an X forest, the answer is essentially the same. Uh, same for the T forest. The S forest is a lot worse, but all of these others are essentially the same. And actually, if you just fit a constant treatment effect uh, to this data set, uh, you again get the same answer. So this is a little bit depressing and strange, right? How could you get these treatment effect estimates look very different? Uh, and yet, uh, these R losses you get from them are almost the same. Seems odd what's going on. And to help um, understand better, um, it's helpful to uh, expand or uh, decompose the square uh, term involved in the R loss. So here, Y tilde I'm writing is the centered outcome, that is Y minus M, and W tilde is the centered treatment, uh, W minus E. And kind of using the formula A minus B squared is A squared minus 2AB plus B squared. Um, you can uh, decompose the R loss into three parts. The average of the y tilde squares, the inner product between the y tilde and the tau hat w tilde term, and then the term, third term. And what we see is that this first term dominates the loss function. Um, the R loss is essentially dominated by this average of y tilde i squared. Okay. Another thing that's strange is that this term doesn't in actually involve tau. Kind of the constant T, S, X causal forests are all just different choices of tau hat. So the second and third term are going to be different for all three methods, all five methods. Uh, but this first uh, term is going to be the same for all five methods. So it's kind of strange having uh, the R last be dominated by this term that's actually completely uninformative about uh, tau hat. Um, I should note this kind of thing doesn't happen in prediction, or if it did, essentially the fact that this average of y tilde i squared uh, is very large relative to everything else means that this kind of pseudo outcome, y minus m of xi, is just very, very noisy uh, relative to this tau hat w i tilde, your best prediction of the pseudo outcome uh, given uh, x and w. And if this were a prediction problem, then just kind of having such a noisy outcome relative to your predictor would just mean you have a really lousy R squared. And this would mean you have a very poor predictor. But on the other hand, are we worried about this in uh, the setting of the R loss? It turns out not so much. It's with the R loss, you're always going to see things like this. And it's because even though this thing looks a lot like a prediction loss function, it actually has, um, I mean, it's different. Uh, We've kind of hijacked the, the form of um, the prediction squared error loss function to uh, target a causal effect. And usually this loss function is going to be very noisy, not because your case estimates are bad, but just because the treatment effect um, estimation problem is in a sense harder. Uh, and this means that kind of the natural loss for treatment effect estimation is going to have more noise. But all right, given that we see this and they're kind of most of the contribution in the R loss comes from this term that's uninformative about tau, which should we do? Um, the idea is just look at differences of R losses. If you take two R losses for two different tau hat estimates, this thing here is going to cancel out because it's the same for both. And then you're left uh, with kind of these two terms, which are on a kind of scale that capture uh, what's going on with tau hat. So what we're going to do here specifically is, so we're going to inter be interested in the R loss of our tau hat of interest versus the R loss of some baseline uh, case estimate. And here for this purpose, we're going to use 
a constant treatment effect estimate as our baseline. So now this difference is no longer asking what's the R loss, what's some value, the choice of tau hat, but rather what's the difference between the R loss, one choice of tau hat uh, versus just kind of predicting a constant uh, treatment effect everywhere and um, ignoring any heterogeneity. And if you do this, you get something much more uh, manageable. Um, essentially what happens here is that the T forest and the S forest have positive values of delta. So what this uh, method tells you is that kind of, they're just doing very badly here. Uh, they're in terms of the R loss, they're doing worse uh, than just predicting a constant everywhere. Whereas both the X forest and the causal forest uh, here have negative deltas, uh, which means that they're actually um, improving um, over a constant treatment effect estimate. Um, and that they are actually finding uh, useful treatment heterogeneity here. Another thing is if you look at the T statistics for these uh, findings uh, from the X and causal forest, they're significant. Um, at the 95% level, uh, they're bigger than uh, 1.96 in absolute value. Uh, so so, so a Gaussian P value gives you um, uh, is below 0.05. And what this means is, again, uh, this is more validation that both of these methods are uh, improving over saying that there's no heterogeneity. Um, here, the X forest uh, gives you actually a smaller delta than causal forest. Uh, so the claim here is that the X forest is finding more heterogeneity uh, than causal forest according to the R loss. Uh, but the difference between these two numbers uh, is not significant um, at the 95% level. Anyways. So this is the first uh, thing you can do uh, to compare um, uh, treatment um, effect, uh, different treatment effect estimators, it's to use the R loss. Uh, I just wanted to emphasize, if you look at the raw number of the R loss, it's gonna be kind of disturbing maybe because you're gonna get a very large absolute number for the loss. Um, that's gonna be roughly the same for any method you compare, which is gonna suggest that nothing matters, uh, but, taking differences. Uh, you can cancel out this kind of uninteresting term uh, that kind of made all the loss functions look big. And then you can see meaningful differences between methods. So this is one thing you can do. Um, are there other methods for um, assessing Kate? Um, of course, um, and there's a large and growing number. Um, one thing to emphasize though, is that very often, the reason you want to do fit a Kate estimate was for a certain purpose. Um, and then the best methods for evaluating Kate uh, will essentially be measures of did your tau hat estimates enable you to accomplish the purpose of how you want it to. So uh, kind of, it, it, it's almost impossible to talk about uh, methods for evaluating estimates for treatment heterogeneity entirely in the abstract um, without being connected to kind of the application you want to um, address. But here I'm just kind of very uh, briefly uh, gonna survey a handful of ideas that have been useful in the past. And if you end up um, uh, using uh, estimates of treatment heterogeneity in your own research, uh, you may be able to adapt in ways that are useful. So a first kind of very simple thing uh, you might want to think about is just um, the reason you wanted to estimate tau hat is to generally see are some people more responsive to treatment than the others and how much heterogeneity is there. And so then one very natural way to capture this is to just look at, okay, there are some people in your study who you predicted to have higher than average treatment effects. And some people in your study who you predicted to have lower average treatment effects. Now on held out data, if I actually ask you to estimate the average treatment effect for the people whose tau hats were below average versus the average treatment effect for people whose tau hats were above average, did you find any difference? Um, if 
imagine I have a training set and my training set I train a causal forest. On the test set, I go and divide people into who had low versus high uh, predicted tau hats. And then I compute average treatment effects on those two halves and there's no difference. It kind of really puts into question whether the causal forest learned. Here, on the other hand, you can run this kind of exercise and you get uh, fairly different um, average treatment effect estimates um, in uh, kind of the high versus low groups. Um, so that's uh, somewhat encouraging. Uh, for more um, about this kind of um, exercise, uh, you, can, you can see uh, this kind of application paper. Um, ahead with Susan. Another uh, way to kind of run a sanity check. So, so the way I think about this uh, grouping into high versus low, and then looking at average treatment effects in the high versus low group, it's, uh, it's a pretty low bar to pass uh, for a treatment effect estimator. Um, usually, if you get a really good uh, tau hat estimator, you're going to want to do something more sophisticated with it than just divide people into a high and a low group and call it a day. But it's a very good kind of first sanity check. If your Kate estimator isn't able to reliably group people into a high versus a low group with different average treatment effects, uh, you might uh, be suspicious about its ability to do much anything else. So this uh, uh, calibration check, I'm like, what next falls in the same category. It's again, not asking a huge amount, but if, if, um, if a method doesn't pass this, uh, this check, uh, you may again be worried. So here, what we're gonna do is kind of the, this strange thought experiment. Again, you can think in terms of the training set and a test set. So first uh, on my training set, I'm gonna go learn tau hats. Now I'm gonna go to my test set and on my test set, I'm going to fit a strange linear model. I'm going to run fit a linear model for the treatment effect, where I'm going to ask that the treatment effect is essentially of the form alpha plus beta times tau hat of xi. That is, I'm going to, on my test set, fit a linear model for the kate with a single feature, which is essentially my predicted kate uh, from the training set. So uh, concretely, the way we're going to do it uh, the model we're going to fit like this is we're first going to have this kind of your your kate on the on the test set should be kind of alpha times a measure of the average treat, average of the tau hats uh, say from before uh, plus beta times uh, the deviation um, of tau hats from uh, tau bar. So we're going to run this regression uh, and then we're going to get estimates for both. Uh, this is alpha, um, and this here uh, is beta. And essentially, okay, if alpha and beta were exactly one, then what would this say? Uh, if alpha and beta were one, then that would mean your prediction of the kate on the test set is just tau hat of xi. That is, this regression actually liked the tau hats you learned on the training set and just wanted to preserve them on uh, the test set. Now, uh, on the other hand, if alpha and beta are very far from one, uh, this suggests that something uh, fishy is going on. So in this setting, uh, this mean prediction, this asks kind of how good was the average of the tau bars you got on the training set as an estimate for the um, average kate on a test set. Uh, this is close to one, which means we're doing very suggests we're doing very well um, on the average effect. On the other hand, this differential prediction is kind of saying if tau hat exceeds uh, the average uh, prediction uh, by some amount on the training set, how do you want to interpret this on test set? And here we actually get a coefficient of 1.3, which actually suggests that the causal forest here is underfitting a little bit. So this recalibration is stretching out the predictions and it's saying that kind of a high, I like if, if the, the tau hat predictions you got now were like low versus high, then it would actually prefer on the test set to make predictions that were spread apart uh, by a factor 1.3. Um, 
which suggests that maybe actually the causal force was slightly underfitting uh, on the trading set. So, okay, here we get 1.3. This for a calibration um, exercise um, in, in my book is actually pretty good. Um, what are things that could happen that are very bad? Um, essentially where I get very worried is this number here, uh, the estimate, uh, the coefficient on kind of how should you adjust the spread uh, of your of your case estimates on the test set if this thing isn't significantly different from zero uh, or if it's even negative. If this were negative, it would be pretty embarrassing. It would be saying like, based on the training set, if you think one observation should have a high case, I think actually on the test set should probably have a low case um, and vice versa. So you can look, think about this p-value here as just an overall hypothesis test for did your method find any useful heterogeneity at all. And if this p-value is not significant, uh, this means that kind of when you're trying to reinterpret your tau hats um, on a test set, uh, th then it's not even clear to you that you want to uh, use these predictors at all, or maybe on the test set you'd prefer uh, just uh, estimating the treatment effects overall as constant. So this is the, this is the calibration uh, check. Um, one thing I should note is we implement this in GRF. Um, here I talk about everything in terms of training set and test set, but in GRF we implement this uh, using out of bag predictions. So kind of this tau hat of xi would be your out of bag treatment effect estimate. Uh, and then we run the regression kind of, but we run a regression where for kind of for each data point, uh, the predictor is tau hat of xi, that is uh, the case estimate fitted from everyone uh, but you. One final idea uh, I wanted to mention uh, is this thing called the Chini curve, um, which uh, interestingly has very, uh, has recently become very popular in the marketing literature. And the Chini curve is essentially built on all this idea that in some settings, the reason you're interested in estimating heterogeneous treatment effects is that you have some intervention that's probably gonna be beneficial for everyone but you think some people might benefit from it more than others. And you kind of want to use your case estimates to rank people in terms of how much they're likely to um, benefit from the treatment. And then you're gonna kind of assign people to treatment in order of the ranking. So here, um, the output of this analysis, is typically this, this uh, Gini plot, and on the x-axis, you're gonna have the fraction of people treated from zero to one. And on the y-axis, uh, you're gonna have this uh, number that measures essentially, um, let's say here we're at 0.2. So this would be saying, if I treat the top 20% of people with the highest estimated Kate, um, then what's my estimate of the average treatment effect or not that, the total um, effect the total value um, of treating uh, these 20% um, of the people. So kind of very concretely, and I think this is why it's uh, easy to imagine why or understand why people in marketing like this. Um, if kind of you're sending out flyers and the cost of sending out a flyer is one cent, then you can think about this axis kind of directly measures the cost of the number of flyers you sent and this curve could be like, if, if, if on the y-axis, your treatment effect is kind of how many people did you get to join your service, then you could say, okay, by sending out 200 flyers, I can, uh, or, or 200,000 flyers, I can get 3,000 people to join my service. And by sending out 400,000 flyers, I can get 5,000 people to join my service, uh, something like that. And then uh, this curve kind of captures um, very directly this cost benefit analysis. So again, on the x-axis, you have the, um, the cost and on the y-axis, you have an estimate of the cumulative gain uh, from treating uh, that fraction of people. So again, in implementing the Gini curve, um, there are a number of subtleties um, and a number of choices to make. Um, one overall reference um, that kind of presents this pretty nicely as is by um, and Lee. And actually, uh, the, this plot um, 
I took. It's, it's from a paper that I was working on recently, um, this one, where uh, we considered a setting where actually kind of the cost of intervening, uh, not, not only does the benefits from intervening on different units change, but actually the costs are different. There's kind of one unit intervening on them might be very cheap, whereas another unit intervening on them might be very expensive. Um, and we talked about methods for that problem. Uh, but again, kind of once the dust settles and you want to see how well you did, uh, this kind of Gini curve object is again very useful. Uh, you rank people in order, you want to prioritize them for treatment. On the x-axis, you kind of plot cumulative cost, um, uh, how, much, how much you need to spend uh, to treat that many people. And on the y-axis, you plot cumulative gain. And overall, the plot retains its interpretation as a cost-benefit analysis. <laughs>